This is a Digital Music Trends episode 140 on the 10th of July 2013. This week on the show we discuss Shazam's new round, Daisy and AT&T, YouTube and Vivo and much much more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, uh, the weekly show where we chat about and try to make sense of the week's news in the digital music industry. So DMT is available on many different channels as both audio and video and you'll find it on iTunes, most podcatchers, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud and Stitcher uh, as well as many more uh, different channels uh, across the web. So you can subscribe to the YouTube channel on youtube.com slash digital music trends and this week I would like to extend my thanks uh, to uh, Venture Harbor which is a company that is doing some SEO improvements on DMT and uh, those should be reflected in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Venture Harbor works on content marketing, search marketing, including SEO, consultancy, social marketing, design, and more. So check them out on VentureHarbor.com. And now it's time to introduce this week's guests. Uh, and they've all been on the show before, which is great news. So it means that I haven't really scared people away yet. And uh, we start by introducing Sitar Telly, a managing partner at Connected Venture, which is a venture capital firm focusing on seed and early stage investments based in London. So hi, Sitar, and great to have you on. How's it going? Going very well. Awesome, great to have you. And on the show with us today, I'm uh, also happy to welcome Steve Knopper, author, business news reporter from for Rolling Stone magazine and freelance writer. So hi, Steve, and uh, awesome to have you back. Thank you. Yes, thanks for having me again. And finally, great to welcome back uh, to the show uh, Nick Osterbach, uh, founder of Sari Music, a company that specializes in digital mu- marketing for small to medium-sized companies and uh, management companies especially. So hey, Nick, how's it going today? Oh, hey, all, all good here. Thanks awesome. for having me. It's great to have you. Uh, so we are uh, going to start today by talking about uh, a round of funding. So uh, there's a couple of funding stories today. So it's great to have uh, Sitar actually uh, on board for the show. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we can talk about it. And uh, Shazam has closed a round of funding worth 40 million uh, thanks to the backing of uh, Carlos Slim, the world's uh, richest man, according to Forbes, uh, valued at 73 billion. Uh, and the investment comes from uh, one of Slim's companies, which is a Mexican mobile operator, America Mobile, which actually constitutes uh, the bulk of his fortune uh, and Shazam now counts uh, roughly 350 million users worldwide and is responsible for around 300 million dollars in digital goods sales uh, and uh, it, it's tight iOS integration with uh, iTunes makes it, makes it very easy for people to buy goods when they when they find them on uh, uh, on Shazam but of course uh, the service is available all uh, across uh, all sorts of different platforms and um, and of course one of the core interests of Shazam in the last uh, year or so has been to integrate uh, with TVs and they have uh, done a fantastic deals with uh, the uh, Grammy Academy uh, and with the Academy Awards uh, uh, and uh, uh, they've also worked in advertising a lot and so uh, another big field of expansion for the company so this is an interesting development because uh, uh, you know Shazam's CEO uh, actually said that they didn't need the money uh, but it could prove really fruitful because America Mobile counts around 260 million subscribers in Latin America and uh, you know the investment is a real validation of the Shazam model in the sense that you know somebody like uh, Carlos Slim to invest in a company means that he believes that there is a, a, you know a solid business model behind it so uh, first of all how do you see this new development shape the future of the company in terms of uh, emerging markets Markets, first of all, and also uh, the way in which digital uh, purchases are actually happen on mobile, happening on mobile in these uh, particularly emerging markets in, in South America and, and in Asia. So, Sitar, I'll start with you. Yeah, so I, I was actually, I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was surprised. I mean, I think geographic expansion is, is what's left for Shazam as it's already expanded its content areas. Yeah. Uh, but music remains its single biggest. Uh, area and I think it's still what the company is best known for. I, I was a bit surprised at South America only because I I don't know what actual purchase rates for music are uh, in in a lot of the countries in South America. Yeah. Um, I, I I and I I don't know and I don't think the problem there has been you know ease of use and the lack of integration with the great phone platform. I, I think the problem has been a financial problem yep. in that most of the countries don't have the economic resources to spend money on music. Uh, so I, I, I was a bit surprised. Uh, also, I think Shazam has been most successful on iPhone. Yep. And I believe, if, I don't know if this is still true, but I know as of a few months ago, Brazil had the single most expensive iPhone in the world. Yeah, it's not, so it's I, not I, particularly I, adopted there, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, there's quite a few people with it, uh, and it's actually the only place where I've seen a completely fake iPhone uh, in the wild lots of times. Um, it, uh, it looks the same, the software's terrible. But yeah, yeah. so I, 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 was, I was surprised at their, their choice of market. 
Yeah. Because uh, I, I mean, I, it, at the company at this stage, they really need to be thinking about revenue expansion in relation to geographic expansion. Exactly, and and you know the company is going to be battling uh, between its, uh, of, of course, affiliate revenues, which uh, even with the three hundred million dollars worth of sales, actually are a, a, a relatively small amount, and the much bigger income that it can derive from partnership with the Grammys and with the Academy Awards, and for example, at the Super Bowl uh, um, earlier this year, uh, the ad by the fast food chain Jack in the Box uh, led. You know uh, that company to have the most mobily engaged advert during the show, and so that was a, a big win for Shazam because they were a big part of that advert in terms of integration. So, uh, so all those things probably amount to a lot more money for them than the actual uh, uh, affiliate revenues that they get from the sale of digital goods. So, uh, Steve, how do you see uh, Shazam's relationship uh, evolve in terms of affiliate revenues versus uh, corporate clients, for example? Do you think affiliates are going to still play a big part for them? I don't really have too much to add to this. I'm not. I'm not a huge expert on the South American market, frankly. But um, yeah. but I, I. I mean, the only thing I would add to to what Sitar said was is, is that Shazam is aggressively trying to expand it. I mean, I think you're right that the core is still music and music identification and the and the you know, the interaction with download stores such as yeah. iTunes. But I think that Shazam has been quite clear that they would like to expand into TV and advertising and really bump up their revenue in in that direction yeah um so and and that's all i can really add to it I, I can't really tell you what the advertising market and the tv market is like in south america absolutely yeah, um, sure. but but i would just imagine that their idea is hey here's a whole bunch of new people that we could get um yeah. beyond what they have already so that that's that's my uh somewhat uneducated look at that uh, so, Nick, um, what are your thoughts on Shazam? And we're talking about, uh, uh, before the Skype uh, broke down completely, we're talking about uh, the, the fact that the company has uh, uh, now a choice whether to go after big uh, corporate clients, of course, for the advertising uh, uh, and uh, for, for the corporate world, like, for example, the Academy Awards, or to go for more granular, for example, uh, campaigns that it could do for, with, uh, with smaller bands, for example. Do, do you see a value there for Shazam to provide some sort of services of this kind? Yeah, well, well, I think like uh, the, the the basic points kind of uh, came through that like it, it's it's a natural time for Shazam to be expanding. Yeah. And uh, why not Latin America? And uh, doing that with a partner, it's uh, it's more strategic than actually about like trying to make money or give equity away in their service. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it all makes sense. And like you know, as it's been for a long time, like the the, the long the long term strategy for Shazam is in advertising and kind of being like a library for fingerprinting yeah. uh, in in TV wherever else uh, in anywhere basically. Yeah. So sure. you know that. But those are the kind of two areas, I think, where they're going to be kind of trying to figure out, like, where should the business go? Yeah. And uh, we're going to uh, move on about, uh, to talk about Project Daisy, which is uh, something that we haven't talked about in a few weeks on the show, actually, because uh, uh, they've kind of gone quiet uh, since announcing uh, that uh, the service was going to happen a few months ago. Uh, the service is uh, due to start, uh, uh, you know, operating you know, probably in Q Q3, Q4 of this year. Uh, the company, of course, uh, is uh, backed by uh, Jimmy Yovine uh, from Beats, by Dr. Dre and is looking apparently to strike a deal with a mobile carrier. So uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, AT&T apparently is in the picture uh, and uh, this would allow the service to ramp up its user base super quickly without having to go through you know millions of dollars of marketing spend or doing uh, too much uh, work on that front because of course AT&T would grant them a huge user base from the get-go. So uh, first of all uh, you know where do you see uh, Daisy being in terms of negotiating position, like do you think that uh, AT and T has got a stronger uh, position in the sense that it can offer Daisy this huge uh, platform, or does the association with Beats by Dr. Dre actually, uh, or is that strong enough by itself to actually carry the service and help it strike a decent deal with one of these uh, operators? Uh, Steve, what's your take on that from from a US perspective? I feel like AT and T could walk away from this deal easier than Daisy and Beats could. I mean, yeah. I, I, unless I'm missing something, like like obviously, you know, Beats has been a very successful company. The people behind it, Jimmy Iovine and and um, Ian Rogers, really good people. And and you know, I imagine that when their service finally does roll out, it'll be something interesting, something cool. But yeah. right now, it's just sort of hard to conceptualize. There's so many really strong players in the space. You know, why would I want to do Beats' 
um, streaming service when I have Spotify or Mog or RDO or songs or, you know, whatever else it is, plus buying stuff on iTunes. It just, it just seems crowded. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess that'd be my feeling about it. I, I feel like it would be a hard sell to take this sort of vague, yeah, we're going to do this great service kind of thing to a, a major company like AT&T. However, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not privy to all the details, I'm sure. And, and Jimmy Iovine is a, is a much better and more experienced deal maker than I am. So, yeah, sure. Uh, Nick, uh, looking at this uh, uh, potential deal, you know, uh, we, we look back at what has happened in the streaming space uh, to other companies like Spotify, for example, which has made successful deals, for example, in Germany uh, with, the, uh, with the carrier there and, and a few other countries, but it hasn't really managed to land a major carrier deal in the US. And uh, some blame it on the fact that it's you know, a brand recognition problem because Spotify is uh, still uh, in its, you know, it's, it's growing, but it's still not a, a, a major company in terms of being recognizable. Uh, how do you feel about uh, AT&T choosing a, a newcomer like Daisy instead of somebody like Spotify in the US to come into the market with a streaming service offering? Yeah, um, well, well, I think like from my point of view, um, uh, when, when, um, when Beats and those guys, like when, when they bought MOG, MOG yeah. doesn't, didn't have any technology that was superior to their competitors, it was basically falling back uh, with the race. Yeah. And now, like, uh, after, uh, since Jimmy Iovine, or however say, you say his I know, name, I can't pronounce it, sorry. Kind of, yeah, uh, he got in board. Like, there's been a very good PR effort on, like, you know, how Daisy will be this, uh, you know, like, direct to fan kind of different version uh, and kind of a more the kind of a top spin angle of uh, how you're connecting the fans direct. Uh, to the streaming so, uh, streaming space, yeah. but like so far, we haven't seen any features that would like you know put them ahead of their competition. Um, I think like uh, something they've uh, uh, emphasized a lot is uh, curation and the importance of curation. But then also, I would argue that like you know, uh, if you have if you're trying to build a global service, how do you do curation? Yeah. Wouldn't you then need some kind of mechanical curation with human curation? And then uh, that being said, Spotify's um, Spotify's uh, kind of recommendation features are actually pretty good, and uh, I think like you know. Um, they have a lot of work to do to be able to compete with 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 Spotify and our deal. Absolutely. And uh, currently they're falling falling behind, and there's just this big promise of like this new service, but it, it, a lot of the hype comes from like the people involved. So I think like they have to deliver on you know what they're promising. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Hopefully it's gonna. Hopefully we're gonna see something concrete soon and not just talk. Exactly, and and Sitar, that, that makes a really good point because uh, you've worked with a lot of early stage companies uh, and see them mm -hmm. saw them through to launch, and so how do you feel about the tactic of hyping up the company so much from the get go? Uh, is it is it incredibly dangerous to uh, create the image of this like really cool new uh, new layout, new way of offering the music catalog uh, the type idea uh, when? we don't really know if the company is going to be able to deliver. And if it can't deliver to the standard that it promised, then it's going to be seen as a, as a failure, even if it is a, a, you know, a decent service. Uh, yeah, I, I usually find that tactic fairly dangerous. Uh, and I don't know that there's a lot of benefit to it. Although I think Topspin, uh, Ian's previous company, took the same route. Yeah. Uh, and again, I think it was a dangerous route for them because they ended up under-delivering a lot initially. Uh, on the, especially on the self-service marketing bit of it. Uh, so I'm surprised they went down the same route again. Then again, with the people involved, I'm not sure you could have done this in a stealth manner. Yeah. You know, there's some pretty big names, so I'm not sure they had a choice uh, ab about it. Also, I think, you know, the, the Beats, it, it is quite a good technical product, the headphones, but it's, it's also brilliant marketing. Yeah. And I don't know that they would have chosen any other route. Uh, and then in terms of whether there's really an opportunity for them, you know, I, if you were to say all people want is just access to all music, then I would say no, because I think you can already get that, uh, not even on Spotify, frankly, most people get it on YouTube, which yeah. is the single biggest music provider in the world. Uh, but actually the problem isn't that, the problem is one of user experience, and the Spotify user experience yeah. hasn't changed in about five years. 
you know, it's it's an incredibly dated user experience. And some of the stuff they've released recently, especially with Discovery, I think is moving in the right direction. Yeah. But if Daisy has any opportunity, it'll be, I think, in providing just a much better user experience for people, particularly around playlisting, which is, I think, an area where uh, Spotify just hasn't done nearly as much as they could have. Yeah, and that, so that, that makes a lot of sense. But, but also, like, uh, one of the things that... I was thinking is, uh, of course, it makes sense for them to have started with this huge, you know, uh, bombastic type of, of, of campaign on the fact that they're going to be the best service out there if they want to land a, 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 a carrier service like that, because then they already have the hype and then it's a chip in their pool to be able to play with uh, somebody like NTNT to say, look, we've already had all this press, everybody's excited about it. If you do a deal with us, then people are going to be excited about it, they're going to report it, they're going to talk about it and all that. So so maybe that's another reason why they decided to go for the sort of all out, uh, uh, we're going to be the best type uh, type scenario. Well, the, the other, I think, angle to that is, I think Beats has generally a very positive sentiment amongst consumers. Yeah. I don't think AT&T does. <laughs> just guessing uh, <laughs> that AT&T does not. And it could be that AT&T also just wants that brand association. Yeah. Yeah, would make a lot of sense. And uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, YouTube, like you mentioned uh, just a second ago, uh, there's a very interesting uh, story that actually was uh, uh, from last week, uh, but uh, I didn't manage to talk about it last week because the show uh, ran long, as usual. Uh, and uh, it's the fact that uh, YouTube and Vivo have finally announced a renewal of the deal, uh, and uh, that deal had expired actually a couple of months ago, and uh, there were uh, debates as to whether Vivo was going to go and strike out on its own, which are probably mostly a tactic for Vivo to actually uh, be able to get some better terms from YouTube, uh, for example. Uh, but, you know, as far as I could see, this is an inevitable renewal in the sense that Vivo needs YouTube to get the majority of its traffic and YouTube needs Vivo uh, in terms of the premium content that it can bring to the platform and the and the huge artists that it has on board. And so, uh, you know, according to the Financial Times, uh, uh, um, Google will actually be investing in Vivo uh, to the uh, sum of 40 to 50 million dollars, which translates to about a 7% stake in the company. And, uh, you know, this kind of s seems to seal the partnership off for good as a long-term one, especially if they have a stake in the company now. So I can't see them separating, uh, you know, Vivo from YouTube anytime soon. So, uh, what do you think about uh, you know the renewal? Of course, of course, uh, you probably find that it's inevitable, li like I did. But, but do you think that Vivo had any chance of surviving a spinning off YouTube? And uh, who would have been damaged the most, YouTube or Vivo, from an eventual uh, breakup of the of the conversation on that front? Uh, 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 Steve, do you have any points on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess my only point would be the simple point that um, that I think Vivo and YouTube are, are pretty linked. I, I think for yep. Vivo to, to try to make it on its own as a standalone or, or working with some other company, I think would be a real stretch for them. So, so um, yeah, basically, I mean, I think that uh, that this this investment, um, this deal between YouTube and Vivo is is a survival thing for Vivo. I think Vivo does bring some value to to YouTube. Um, but certainly YouTube could, could survive without, without Vivo fairly well. Yeah. Um, it would be missing some content, certainly a lot of universal stuff um, and, and other partnership stuff, other content stuff with labels. But, uh, you know, I think, I think this partnership works for both of them. And, uh, and Nikkei, what's your take on that? Do you think that uh, Vivo uh, had any other options uh, uh, as far as distribution? And... Uh, uh, in that sense, uh, do you think that maybe it's too tightly uh, tied to uh, Google, even if it is supposedly a separate company? Yeah, well, I, I think like uh, with Vivo, with like I think 70% plus traffic coming from YouTube search, they were always like linked in with uh, with YouTube quite, you know, deeply. So I don't know, like, you know, when, when there were like these kind of uh, talks about you know, like maybe striking a partnership with Facebook or something that could probably be facilitated. But like, you know, it would have to be like, you know, kind of reinventing how they do business. Yeah. Uh, because as far as I know, uh, everything from insights into how videos go in, like, you know, so so much is, being, is, is using the YouTube infrastructure that yeah. like, you know, uh, what has Vivo ever, ever been more than like a curational layer on top of YouTube from one point of view? Yeah. So uh, I think like, you know, it would have been uh, a very, you know, it, it would have been a massive change and they would have kind of had to start from scratch. Yeah. And something I thought today is that probably the insights tools, like all their insights is also probably 
uh, using YouTube infrastructure. So I don't know where, where would that leave with like, you know, them being able to take that content and being able to make smart marketing decisions or curational decisions with that content without uh, the in inside element. But yeah. I'm, I'm not 100% I'm sure about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then um, I think like with, with Google uh, uh, investing into Vivo, I think that that's, uh, as Steve said, like it's, you know, it's, a, it's an example of like, it, it's a token of uh, that like, you know, they're going to be working together and uh, kind of uh, to deepen the partnership and take it onto that level. And I think the Vivo will keep on going as it's been going the last few years. And it will be a big, uh, important music destination. The the bigger change I see is uh, what's going to happen between managers and like, are they going to allow their videos to go uh, on Vivo? Or I mean, right. like, you know, if 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 there's an artist manager or an artist who create content uh, and they want to develop their own YouTube channel, that that's in, in that can be in conflict with. Uh, their label agreement and uh, videos going up on YouTube, uh, up on Vivo. Yeah. But like you know, you, usually how it works is like who pays the bills. They you know they they, they put the asset wherever they want to. But like there, there, there's a big shift coming coming now between managers and labels. Is that like if you need to be developing your own YouTube channel or if you need to be in control of your own assets, where does Vivo fit into that mix? That makes a lot of sense. And uh, Sitar, do you think that uh, you know the seven percent or so, you know whatever percentage it is that now Google owns uh, of uh, of Vivo, does that you know ensure essentially that uh, Vivo won't be able to play this card again in terms of uh, you know getting voices? For example, you know like the rumors that circulated that it would perhaps separate as a different company, and and does that uh, sort of limit the potential negotiating power of Vivo in respect to its biggest business partner essentially? Uh, don't know. I mean, seven percent doesn't seem like a big enough stake yeah. uh, to be able to. But then again, uh, you know, you can you can negotiate a small equity stake and very strong rights associated with it. Uh, and a lot of times, corporates do. Yeah. Uh, so, and I I don't believe the investment came from Google Ventures, did it? It came from no. the Google, yeah. came from Google as a company, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it. it the, the precursor to, to an acquisition. So I, I don't think they're going to do that. Uh, I don't, I, I, I'm not entirely sure uh, what the terms of it are other than to give, you know, effectively the rest of the, of the deal is a revenue share between the two companies, right? So, so this would just be a way for, for Vivo to get some funding in, I guess, to run operations without uh, having to, to, to split it uh, back to Google. Yeah. I, I, I I don't know how much it, it really limits uh, what, it, it, actually a better way to say it, I don't think the equity stake limits it uh, nearly as much as Vivo's total dependency on, you, on, yeah. on YouTube to limits it. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, and staying on that subject, actually, I'll stay with you for a second, talking about uh, uh, MCNs. So uh, Base79 raised uh, a new round uh, uh, of an amount undisclosed. So uh, multi one of the biggest multi-channel networks on YouTube. Uh, it had a 10 million round back in November, and now the new round comes from Evolution Media Growth Partners. So, uh, of course, it's one of the biggest channels on YouTube. It's got over 650 million views per month. And, uh, you know, actually, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, actually, the Digital Music Trends is going to be on uh, on Base 79 at some point soon uh, mm -hmm. in the next uh, couple of weeks or so uh, but uh, you know uh, what, I, what I'm wondering is also for, for those channels like for Vivo uh, there is a huge dependency on YouTube uh, and uh, you know in, in business we're always sort of told that don't put all your eggs in one basket when it comes to only having essentially one source of one source of uh, income, and all these companies are really depending on YouTube so so heavily uh, for their income. Do you think they have uh, uh, any chance of spinning out into into their own separate ventures, uh, or is that just going to be the way that it is, and they're going to have to carry on uh, with this uh, complete dependency on, on Google? Essentially, uh, what do you reckon on that? Uh, uh, I think it's like well, I, I don't know base. 79 well enough, I guess, yeah. to comment on them specifically. I think for any kind of content network, in order for them to have any kind of uh, independency, they need to be a bit like maybe College Humor is and build a brand 
yeah. around their content that's so strong that they become a destination site in their own right. But I mean, Base 79's strategy hasn't been that, at least from, from, from what, I, what, what I read, it's been instead to just acquire content and use Google as distribution. Yeah. Uh, and and it could be that that's just more efficient or economical for them yeah. than, or than, just a than trying to yeah than 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 trying to build their own brand. Although it could be that the the name change to Base Seventy Nine uh, is is you know, it, it's probably the first step uh, to to the. I mean, what was it before? It was uh, video rights. My video rights. It was a, it was a terrible brand. <laughs> so it, it could be that, that the rebrand is just a, a, a first step to, to them eventually creating their own brand, which is a destination site people go to. The problem is their, their videos don't have a, a, a tight, coherent theme around them the way, say, College Humors does or some other video d destination sites do. And I think yeah. unless you're creating those kinds of brands, it's difficult to, you, to, to, to become a direct site versus you have to rely on, on YouTube. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about this week, which is uh, slightly tacky, but it's quite interesting in terms of uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, how companies are placing themselves on, on, on the digital music space online, is uh, looking at the new Firefox mobile operating system. So uh, the system has gone on sale in Spain uh, already. It was announced uh, quite, quite, you know, not, not, not such a long time ago, really. And it uh, relies completely on open standards, uh, you know, like, uh, like Firefox does. It relies on HTML5 for all its applications. And so the aim is for Mozilla to break down the garden walls that are currently rising higher and higher when it comes to mobile operating systems. And so uh, the music angle is that Seven Digital jumped on board from the get-go to provide users with access to its catalog and the ability to buy music on their devices. And of course, this is a very, very small market right now, uh, you know, made of... Uh, it, a few people that are going to buy, or maybe lots of people are going to buy this in Spain, and uh, enthusiasts that are using it on uh, uh, Raspberry Pis and uh, and maybe hack their their Android phones to run it. Uh, uh, but you know, it could actually see a wider release, especially if the prices are kept as low as they have been in Spain. I think it's for sale on sale uh, outright for only about like seventy or eighty euros or something around those lines. And so. Um, well, what are your thoughts, Steve, on uh, having another party added to the equation? And also, do you think that it is conceivable to, you know, have a leg up in an environment like that when there are uh, so many different services? And perhaps Seven Digital really thought uh, it's it's a good idea to be the first. Uh, uh, person to jump on this on the ship and uh, perhaps users will take notice and will start actually buying tracks on the service as it's the, really the only way to access music right now on those phones. Um, yeah, I mean, Seven Digital is is interesting. I, I you know, it, again, it, it's a very crowded marketplace, and you've got iTunes and Amazon and all all these other players that are that are actually kind of dominating it. Um, I mean, Seven Digital is trying to find these very specific niches in territorially and also with devices, and um, you know, there's there's a they're getting a foothold, and and yeah. they're doing a pretty good job of finding those niches. Um, you know, and so maybe they'll just continue to survive with those niches. So, so that would be fine. Whether they're going to be a, a more dominant player and, and compete with iTunes, I, I think it's probably. Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, sit up for, for you. Uh, do you think you know it's it's a good strategy to be present? Uh, you know, I know Seven Digital is one of the companies that has the most presence uh, on uh, different uh, operating systems on mobile, and uh, you know we're seeing more and more companies launch uh, their apps on Windows Mobile, for example. Uh, you know how how important is it to be present uh, right from the get go on a system like that, uh, uh, in case that it takes off? Uh, so. <laughs> What would what we advise most of our investments to do is focus on, on the core platforms where you think there's the biggest audience. Yeah. And from that perspective, I wouldn't ever suggest one of our companies uh, focus on Firefox OS. Yeah. Uh, in fact, what we, what we generally advise them is it's iOS, it's iOS and it's Android. Uh, and, and that's pretty much it. And even to stay away from, from Windows. And, and you know, for most startups, and even, even you know, mid-sized companies, a platform is extremely hard. Two platforms is just an order of complexity much, much higher. Uh, and every time you add a platform, uh, it just becomes harder and harder and harder. Uh, and and in terms of complexity, I think iOS is probably the simplest. Yeah. Uh, the others I don't know about. And and I, I know uh, what, what Mozilla has been pushing quite a bit is the fact that it's an HTML5 one. So you don't have to, uh, you don't have to, uh, build something new, but actually most websites aren't really built for access on mobile. Yeah. 
they don't really scale down for it. And so I think uh, it would require development to be a, you know, a, a super mobile HTML5 friendly site. And I, I, I don't know that that's most people's core focus today either. Yeah. Uh, and most startups focus at, at, least, at least initially. Sure. I wanted to go continue on the show uh, by talking about uh, Jay-Z and his uh, uh, release saga because that's uh, really one of the most inter interesting stories of the last few weeks. We've been talking about it almost every week uh, since it began. And this week, uh, uh, of course, the RAA yesterday uh, ruled that uh, this, the release is already platinum after changing the, its, its own rules uh, to scrap the 30-day wait that was required even from digital album releases. And, of course, deciding to count the Samsung sales as part of the uh, platinum certification so now the record is platinum and there was also a very uh, interesting article from uh, John uh, Perlis on the New York Times uh, talking about the security implications of uh, the Jay-Z app on Samsung so uh, that's that brings up uh, some really important points uh, to do with the giveaway itself and how that might work out for other artists as well so according to uh, Perales uh, the applications uh, the application required to download the uh, Mania Carta Holy uh, Holy Grail asks for uh, number one permission to read uh, the phone's status and identity. It will also uh, also gather the, the accounts, so the email addresses and the social media usernames connected to the phone. It also asks users to log into either Facebook or Twitter to allow uh, the app to post. And finally, every single time the user wanted to see the lyrics of the song they were listening to, uh, they were prompted to uh, post on either Facebook or Twitter. And the post could be changed, could be edited, but they had to post something every single time they listened to a track. So this seems like a lot of work for just a release. And and, um, you know, uh, you know the, the New York Times wonders whether Jay-Z went from being paranoid about being watched by the feds to actually being the one that's snooping around in people's phones. So uh, I, I want to ask you, is this a necessary price to be paid for a free piece of content that would have probably cost you uh, $8 if you were uh, to buy it on iTunes? Uh, you know, are they asking you for too much information? And uh, do people care? I mean, if people are prepared to give all this information away and they don't question it, then I'm sure that other... Uh, releases and other organizations are going to do exactly the same thing. So, uh, uh, sorry, Nick is still away, isn't he? Yeah, uh, Sitara, what, what, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, on the app in general? It, well, I didn't get to see the app. So yeah. I, I, no, no, I on, on, the, on the privacy implications, like on the fact that it's gathering so much data for you and all you're getting is, you know, is an album, which is great, but, you know, it's, it's an $8 purchase and if you have to surrender everything about you in order to get it, then it becomes like a, a different conversation, doesn't it? Well, from a pure human psychological standpoint, people surrender information for a lot less, like three <laughs> pens. Uh, so, so, so I'm not su surprised that people do it. What, what, what yeah. I'm more concerned with is, so, so what, when, when I read the article, what, what concerned me more was that they asked for all of these things in a way that just seemed like a terrible user experience. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's, that's probably going to affect whether this happens again more than anything else. Uh, and... You know, it, and it's not going to be a question of, well, I'll pay the $8 or I won't. It'll be, I'll download it for free yeah. or I won't. And I just won't go through the pain of this. And I think, you know, the, the, the thing that Spotify did really well is it made it easier to get music legally than, than illegally. Yeah. And this app feels like a, a step back from that uh, for consumers. So, you know, if it had really been, uh, you know, all the, a million Samsung users get get the the album for free and that had been it and they just relied on on people to share the album because they liked it that would have been great yeah. i think forcibly doing it is the bigger issue the, the privacy stuff i don't know I, I don't think about it as much only because i think people have given access to that stuff so often yeah uh that and and they, they oftentimes don't realize they're doing it so that seems more like at least it's good, asking you yeah a good a good newspaper article than yeah. anything else uh, the, the, the bigger the, big, the, the bigger issue it raised for me is that it just seems like a, a step back from for, for, for an album release in terms of just making it really easy for fans to access music. Yeah. And Steve, uh, you know, you, what's the perspective from the US? Uh, have, you, have you seen the app at all? And uh, uh, what's the reaction been so far uh, you know, from, from uh, people that you work with at Rolling Stone or, or elsewhere? So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess my feeling about the pri I, I actually haven't seen the app itself, although yeah. I've seen, obviously, screen grabs and, and a lot of really thorough detail about what, what's in it and so forth. Um, I guess my feeling about the privacy thing is that 
I do think that there's a little bit more to the privacy issue beyond just the user experience, um, although I agree with you, Sitar, about that, um, especially in, in the wake of these um, NSA allegations and, and you know, all, all, this, all this information that's coming out that says the government in the U.S. is, is specifically getting information from major companies like Facebook and, and Google and using this information for, for God knows what purpose. It seems like to come out and and have privacy be an issue for you now is is a, a, at the very least a PR problem, and also the idea that well we're just doing what everybody else does, only in a more obvious way, in a more blatant way that everyone can see. You know, I, I'm not sure that that is is a huge defense. I feel like Jay Z as an artist, and especially someone who has dealt with with these privacy issues in the past. You know, al- although you know his lyrics are more in the context of sort of Hey, I'm a drug dealer. Feds, get off my case. You know, yeah. kind of thing is is often the context in in his lyrics. But still, yeah. as, as Pirellis in the New York Times mentioned, that is a theme that's gone through his music. I mean, I think he's someone who can sort of come out and be proactive on this issue, and and, and at least that's what my sources are telling me. Yeah. And in fact, Jay Z, you know, he did this Twitter Q and A the other day, and there were a million questions for him, and um, he actually did sort of respond to the tweet. It suggests that he was conciliatory. He suggested, I forget his exact wording, but it was sort of like, that sucks, we'll do better next time. Yeah. So, do you think he, he didn't know? It sounds like he didn't know. Well, I mean, I think his, his Twitter response was four words, so you, you kind of <laughs> have to do it what he said based on that. Yeah. My guess, and what sources are speculating to me, is that, yeah, he didn't know that either he didn't know about the privacy thing or he didn't suspect that it would blow up into this public relations black eye um, that it's kind of become for him. And and as Sitar suggests, I mean, it's not just the privacy privacy thing. It's also that there were, there were technical glitches and people had trouble downloading the app and they were turning their phones on and off a million times and, and shutting down the service. And I guess, and sources are sort of suggesting this too, but it seems like this is a bigger PR black eye for Samsung yeah. than it is for Jay-Z. I mean, you would imagine that. It, it sort of reminds me of um, a couple years ago when, when Ticketmaster had just said, we're going we're gonna to merge with Live Nation. Everybody should, should agree to this merger. Yeah. Um, and the very next thing that happened was this thing about how um, you know, there was this fish thing where, where uh, all these fish tickets – where there there's a big problem in, in people getting on the on the Ticketmaster site and it froze and then there's an issue with Springsteen and so you, you know if you're a tech company and you're showing I have the juice to compete in this space with major major artists <laughs> in the music world you got to get it right yeah yeah so, sure so I feel like that's sort of more I would say that's kind of the overwhelming issue more than anything else, although I, I wouldn't necessarily dismiss the privacy stuff I think yeah. I think you know all the privacy things are buried in these terms and conditions that we all blindly sign of and and I think that something's going to that's going to be an issue moving forward especially if we see more issues like like prism and and NSA and so forth yeah yeah and then uh, Nick uh, to bring him back in uh, I wanted to ask what's your take on this you know uh, do you think artists have to be mindful uh, especially if there's a big name to uh, as to how the data that is collected about their user, uh, it, you, you know, the, the, the fans is also uh, stored and used uh, and, and how the user experience of the apps that they put out is because, of course, that, that really reflects on the brand name as well in the end. Yeah, yeah. so ba- basically, like, the, the, there's a lot of conversations now about, like, pre-release strategies and, like, you know, how should you do them, where do you do them? And uh, basically, like in in an ideal world, obviously you would go with uh, with a partner where where all of your fans can access the music, yeah. but then that's your own website in a way. So like that comes back to the argument of like you know the whole idea of like user experience being so bad in JC's case is that like you can argue that one thing he didn't do or his crew didn't do well is give his fans the best easiest way to access his new album i yeah. think this was the opposite um so i mean like uh, from, from a fan point of view this wasn't a good thing from a financial point of view i'm sure it was a very good thing yeah. and uh you know as, as steve said like it's not very good pr for samsung as like you know that they can you know release uh, you know this kind of a simple app um like this yeah yeah so course. yeah that, that makes a lot of sense and and uh, hopefully uh 
you know that, that this will be an interesting lesson for any other artist that is looking at doing this because of course this is we have to remember that this is a, really the first uh, instance of such a big giveaway uh, being done in this way uh, as a pre-release and, and under this yeah. term so so hopefully like uh, artists are, and companies that are working on this on, the, on this field are going to look at how this worked out what didn't work what worked and perhaps provide a better customer experience when uh, when the next one comes around and, and, and you know this these albums releases are, are not they don't come around every day so I would, I would imagine that even if it, it takes off as a practice we wouldn't see more than maybe four or five a year of, the, uh, of this kind it's also to be said like you know if, if the app if the app was performing that badly i'm not sure like um you know i don't think there's like you know the half of you know cia's technical you know intelligence machinery <laughs> plugged into that app so you know yeah, exactly. I, I really don't think like you know that data is going to be used in in any way in yeah. you know like uh, that there's so little focus on like simple email marketing sometimes with major artists like i i really don't think like you know it's some sort of a you know data capture exercise yeah. at least to the extent of like you know what's being reported yeah, sure. Oh. That's cool. Well, uh, guys, uh, I think I, I'm, I'm going to let you go because we had a few technical issues today and uh, the show has ended up uh, running long even if we haven't recorded a huge amount. But uh, I just wanted to run through uh, what you guys are up to at the moment in case there's anything you can or want to talk about or plug. So, Nikke, on, on, your, on your front? I mean, you know, we, we kind of covered the more kind of the, the fan-facing fan-facing conversations here something about like you said about P Pandora and their PR problem you know yeah. what we would have discussed later on but like uh, uh, something that has to be said about that debate I think is that uh, I wish there would be more kind of conversations on kind of you know uh, you know making sure that you also discuss traditional radio every time you blame Pandora on bad payments yeah because like uh, surely that's the future so I mean Pandora should be paying more that's my personal opinion but then again like uh, shouldn't traditional radio be paying more so why are these uh, what was everyone after Pandora because yeah. like if, if Pandora would uh, you know disappear somewhere like that that's the that's such a huge like you know engaged music you know database of fans uh, engaging with internet radio so I hope like you know there's a future for Pandora yeah. so that like everyone's happy and there's gonna be bigger payments yeah yeah absolutely and uh, uh, Steve uh, on your front anything you're working on that you wanna you wanna mention um, just the, well, I, I, the usual stuff. I'm, I'm kind of deep into covering this. Uh, actually, it's good timing this story with uh, with with Jay Z and Samsung right now for Rolling Stone. Right. Um, so uh, so so thanks. Actually, Sitar, some of the stuff that you you said in particular was was helpful. Um, but <laughs> in, in addition to that, don't worry, this, it's off the record. But uh, in, in addition to that, um, I just wanted to let people know that I am actually working on a biography of Michael Jackson that will come out in 2015. So it's. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit of a departure from what I usually write about, but yeah. um, pretty exciting, pretty pretty complex for for the research. Absolutely, and it's it's one of those projects that yeah, if it spans a couple of years, it's a it's really a big one. Yes, I I, I hope so. We'll we'll see. I got to finish it first. <laughs> Absolutely, and uh, Sitar, anything your end? Uh, I know that you, you you know you're you're now uh, working with a few companies there, but I don't think you can talk about any of them yet. So I guess no, uh, no, we'll just no, be. Not yet, but but none are actually in the music space. Right. Uh, so if there's anyone uh, listening or watching that's doing something interesting in music that isn't uh, streaming, yeah, or uh, or discovery. Uh, yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely get in touch if you're not in one of those areas. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, guys, for joining me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, guys. And as you may have noticed this week, we had a couple of technical issues on the video front, uh, which prevented us from running through all of the news uh, that I was hoping to get to. But uh, here is a quick roundup of what we ended up leaving out. And uh, first of all, Songkick uh, last week uh, opened up the tour uh, to a number of new cities in the UK, including Birmingham, Brighton, Bristol, Cardiff, Coventry, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Manchester, Nottingham and Sheffield. So we talked about the tour a few times on the show, a service that lets fans pledge to buy a ticket for an 
artists show, which, if there are enough pledges, then can actually become a reality. And also, can, it, can, it can help uh, artists and promoters gauge uh, the size of the venue needed. So the big question mark we left with a few weeks ago when we spoke uh, last about Detour is the fact that there's a big organizational element in getting these gigs off the ground, which could make the expansion of the project uh, uh, rather slow and not without hiccups. Uh, but the company, as reported by The Guardian, is partnered with a few promoters, including DHP, for example. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's feasible that they're going to be able to uh, organize these promoters so that the gigs are actually uh, happen in, in a relatively smooth uh, fashion. And there were a couple of stories this week on Windows Mobile, so I thought it deserved a shout out for once. The first is about Bing Audio, a service that I knew nothing about until I came across a post on the Windows blog. So Bing Audio apparently offers the same functionality as a Shazam or a SoundHound, but it's built into the search screen for Windows 8 mobile devices in the US. And the feature is now being rolled out to many more countries internationally. So the Bing Audio service is tied to the Microsoft Xbox music streaming service, and it will allow users to add the track they looked up uh, into their Xbox music library, so that's uh, quite a cool tie-up. And the other interesting bit of news uh, about Windows 8 is that Spotify released an updated version of its mobile application, as reported by The Verge, which improves the app and brings in some much-needed functionality, like uh, being able to fast-forward through a track, which, uh, believe it or not, wasn't available beforehand. So, uh, even though these are two different stories, uh, one of internal and one of external development, uh, it's interesting to note that uh, things are moving moving on the Windows uh, Mobile and Windows 8 fronts. And now it's time to talk about the world news, and it seems like this could be a regular segment on Digital Music Trends uh, in the future. And the first up, we have a story from a business inquiry from the Philippines, and the Philippine long-distance telephone company and Universal Music have struck a deal that will allow the carrier's mobile units to distribute the label's music. Uh, through Smart Music, more than 70 million subscribers will have access to more than 3 million tracks under the Universal music group umbrella and the deal allows universal music to expand its business in the philippine which has nearly 100 percent mobile pr penetration and it cuts losses in piracy and it also undercuts the price charged by itunes in the country by more than half which is uh, another interesting move uh, on top of that smart music downloads can be charged against a prepaid or postpaid billing uh, removing the need for a credit card which is also a big plus in this uh, sort of uh, markets and scenarios so this is a very exciting stuff uh, but also i would love to know whether the term Terms of the deal allow for the carrier to strike similar partnerships with the other labels and, and other majors as well, or if this is an exclusive uh, type of scenario. And uh, after that, we talk about South Africa, uh, where the music retail chain Look and Listen, which has uh, 28 physical stores in the country, has announced a partnership with Mondia Media, which will allow it to relaunch its digital music store, a service that was halted in February, presumably due to lack of attraction and high maintenance costs. The joint venture will see Mondia Media leveraging its existing partnerships with artists and labels to deliver a high-quality MP3 store for the retailer. And coming back to London via New York, a hype bot pointed me in the direction of a company called Promohut that is actually based here in London and has launched a pre-release subscription service that allows music fans to gain early access to music directly from the labels. The project is oriented towards the electronic music scene for now and it creates a monthly subscription that aims to monetize a system that was originally of course created to grant professional DJs and reviewers uh, access to those pre-releases and now that's been brought into super fans so uh, that that's got a price tag attached uh, and the service is not cheap uh, starting at 6.99 per month for one pre-release per month uh, or a 12 pound uh, or £12.99 for four uh, pre-releases per month. Uh, and these are delivered as high quality MP3s. So uh, this is an interesting way to monetize uh, on a windowing system uh, of sorts uh, that is already in existence for, for labels uh, when it comes to sending tracks to reviewers and DJs. Uh, and uh, you know, for labels that are not uh, particularly concerned with leaks, uh, that is definitely a, a really interesting path to try out. And finally, Banzoogle has acquired OneSheet. If you haven't heard of either service yet, here's what they do. So Banzoogle is a website building platform aimed specifically at bands, which provides a host of music-specific services in an easy-to-set-up package for $9.99 per month. And it already boasts uh, thousands of artists on, a platform, on its platform. Uh, OneSheet inside is a company that lets entertainers uh, build hassle-free websites. So, uh, you know, two similar companies, and Banzoogle aims to keep OneSheet 
as an independent product and the company's site will be relaunched shortly and that's all for this week thanks so much for tuning into the show if you were watching the video version apologies uh, for uh, the problems that we've had this week with skype that you will have noticed if you were watching the video uh, hopefully we'll have those fixed uh, by next week uh, skype permitting uh, other than that uh, please uh, do visit uh, digitalmusictrans.com and also check out the one-to-one -one show which is uh, a sh uh, uh, another weekly show on the digital music trends network where we talk about uh, the latest uh, startups uh, in the digital music industry and also I interview uh, companies that work in the digital music space about their specific uh, projects uh, which can be quite interesting. Uh, thanks so much for listening uh, again have a great week and until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.